Bonjour, everyone. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to uh, present on the exciting topic of tissue engineering. Um, as Vivian mentioned, I am co-director of the Adipose Stem Cell Center here in Pittsburgh. And my, I'd like to acknowledge my co-director, Dr. Peter Rubin, who's the chief of plastic surgery as well. So for my talk today, just a brief outline, I will uh, discuss the background on tissue engineering and then dive right into injectable or minimally invasive therapies with a particular focus on the use of adipose or fat-derived stem cells, including some clinical studies uh, throughout the world. So the formal def definition of tissue engineering, or TE, as, as many of you know, uh, is shown here. This is a very interdisciplinary field that brings together scientists, engineers, and clinicians in an attempt to restore, maintain, or improve tissue function. The basic strategy for tissue engineering, ideally, we'd like to harvest cells from the patient, expand those cells in culture, see them onto a biodegradable scaffold. That's one of the key points of tissue engineering is that all of our scaffold materials are degradable. Tissue is then grown on the scaffold, and then when implanted in the body, the scaffold dissolves and new tissue is formed. So there's never an indication that a material had been implanted. Here's a nice schematic um, from 1991 from Jake Canty in Boston, showed, demonstrated one of the first reports of tissue engineering, and this is using cartilage from the shoulder bone uh, of a cow, digesting that cartilage with collagenase, I, um, identifying the cells, in this case chondrocytes, seeding them onto a polymer, and implanting them into an athonic or nude, mice, nude mouse, and uh, then the chondrocytes would form new cartilage and the polymer would degrade. So this is the basic premise or the example of tissue engineering. The interdisciplinary paradigm, um, biomaterials, stem cells, and cytokines are used. Tissue engineering, it was the first term. Now regenerative medicine is a more commonly used term to define the entire field of tissue engineering. So injectable therapies, uh, many tissue engineers such as myself focus on an injectable therapy for, for the ease of the surgeon the minute, and it's less invasive for the patient. So uh, my examples today will focus on tissue engineering using minimally invasive surgery. So cell sources to grow tissue, these include stem cells, and there are embryonic stem cells as a source, or um, tissue engineers use adult stem cells. Now the stem cells in blood typically are hematopoietic stem cells. In bone marrow, you have hematopoietic and also mesenchymal stem cells. And in adipose tissue, your primary source is mesenchymal stem cells. Adult cells or somatic cells can also be used, just like the example I showed, using the chondrocytes seated in a scaffold to grow cartilage. That's an example of somatic cell tissue engineering. And examples on the market include using fibroblasts uh, and skin substitutes. So you can use um, adult somatic cells already differentiated, or you can utilize adult stem cells. And um, embryonic stem cells uh, that's for the regrowth of tissue, such as fat, bone, cartilage, and muscle, which tissue engineers tend to focus on, a more suitable source are the mesenchymal stem cells. This is our cell source. This is American fat. It's plentiful, um, and as you can see from, from this image, it's well vascularized. Uh, that's the reason why you can't simply just use whole fat and transplant that into another area because you cut off all of this vascularization and the adipocytes die. So you typically fat grafting leads to 20 to even 90% resorption of the fat. So instead, as tissue engineers, we'd like to utilize the stem cells that reside in this fat. So why is fat a good source for stem cells? Um, it's very easy to harvest. You can, right now in the United States, you can go to your dermatologist. And he or she can extract a syringe full of fat from your abdominal region and inject that fat into your face to temporarily remove wrinkles. 
but as i mentioned, that fat will resorb after a couple months and then you go back to your dermatologist to get another injection. but it is very easy to harvest. it's typically plentiful and expendable tissue and the stem cells in the fat have been identified. um fat is typically removed by liposuction here. Uh, my colleague dr. rubin does do liposuction but we also uh, focus on um, full body contour, abdominoplasties, basically any elective cosmetic surgery that results in discarded adipose tissue we bring to the lab. So the discovery of cells in the lab, uh, or, I'm sorry, in adipose tissue, actually about 30 years ago, it was determined that there's not just adipocytes in adipose tissue, but another smaller cell that looked like a fibroblast was discovered. and and in 76, Darnick said, well, if you treat these fibroblast-like cells with insulin, you can differentiate them to adipocytes. So for 30 years, they were examined as, they were called pre-adipocytes and examined in di diabetes research, obesity research. Um, it really wasn't until 2001 that these pre-adipocytes were found to be multipotent. And this was by uh, Zook and colleagues, and these, uh, stem cells have been termed adipose derived stem cells by the international fat community, um, fat stem cell community. So adipose tissue, this it can be uh, differentiated the cells from fat into muscle, bone, fat, and cartilage. This was the first report by Zook and colleagues in 2001. You could see the image of the cells. They're very fibroblast-like and they're very similar to bone marrow stem cells. The plasticity of these cells so fat is derived from the mesoderm. So these are mesenchymal stem cells. So differentiating them into tissues all derived from the mesoderm is non-controversial and now well established. So this table here shows both in vitro and in vivo animal studies differentiating the adipose derived stem cells into fat, bone, cartilage, muscle, cardiomyocytes, bone marrow, for example. Now, can these cells differentiate into neurons? Um, a few have published uh, some early reports saying yes, in vitro we can, and in vivo perhaps they do help. Uh, this is a stroke model, for example. Um, however, in vitro, the differentiation is the trans differentiation into neurons has been very, very poor, not efficient. So these studies show less than 1% of the cells will differentiate into neurons, which will then die in a week. So there's a lot of research in this field of attempting to utilize the stem cells in fat to differentiate into neurons. What about endodermal, such as liver, epithelial cells? Um, again, we're still in the early stages and still trying to determine what factors can make these cells differentiate into, say, ker keratinocytes or hepatocytes. These cells I mentioned already are very similar to bone marrow derived stem cells, very similar surface markers, um, and also appear to be um, immunologically, uh, um, immune cells without an immunological response. Mainly though, these cells are utilized for their cytokine expression. So ASCs do express growth factors such as VEGF, vascular endothelial growth factor, HGF, TGF beta, and when they're cultured under hypoxic conditions, their expression of these angiogenic factors increases.